Hey everyone, welcome to Building Enter Guys. On this episode, we're actually just teleporting back in time to 2015 when we built the first R car, a small Enter Guys prototype. This was definitely a learning experience. Let me tell you, looking back at this, a lot of cringeworthy moments, a lot of life lessons. So where did it all start? So in 2015, me and my partner, after coming back from previous Burning Man's thought, wouldn't it be cool, inspirational, uh, a way to give back to the community to build an R car? So the concept was to build kind of like a small spaceship. It had two nacelles on the side. It had a glowing saucer that had programmable LEDs on the bottom. And then it could see two to four people. Fully electric to kind of go with the ecos uh, of being clean uh, and green. And also I, I'm a bit of an EV enthusiast myself. So I decided that, hey, why don't I like, build in our car based on a custom electric drive platform? Now you might ask, why did you start with a golf cart? Lots of electric art cars are based on golf cart platforms. One of the reasons was, and it was definitely looked into, was used golf carts are actually kind of expensive. There's a several thousands of dollars. And at the time we kind of wanted to use a budget of around a thousand dollars to see if we can build something from scratch. So since the budget was relatively low, I just wanted to give myself a few hundred dollars to build these batteries for a car that could you know, drive people around. It was pretty, pretty hard to, to come by. Uh, so what I actually found was eBay had used laptop batteries from sellers that actually tested them a little bit, made sure that they'd actually like hold a little bit of a charge. And they were only like three to like $5, like maybe $6. So I ordered a bunch of those. In fact, I ordered almost 50 batteries. So the next challenge, after prying all these cells out of the battery packs, was to find out what condition these cells were in. So I googled these batteries, and it looks like they're LG brand, which isn't too bad. I did do a, a test on my multimeter, and the voltage just came out to be 3.67-ish, so they're seeming to be pretty good shape. And I opened up another one, it looks like they're still LG, but a different, uh, different spec one, so I'm going to give that a Google too. The genuine Lenovo batteries seem to be actually pretty good, they're really just you pop the screwdriver in the corner and then you turn it and the case pops open and then you can lift out the whole uh, canister of rows here. And then you just pull them apart and cut the leads off and that's it. Individually testing each battery cell ended up taking forever. So what I ended up doing was after testing a dozen of them and, 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 and spreadsheeting that out, uh, basically the, the capacity, the milliamp hours that I was able to pull out of each single cell created a linear regression model in that spreadsheet. And that means that I was able to actually plot out what a real battery pack should look like. Uh, so that I can quickly test about 15 to 30 minutes of uh, the voltage reading as it drops, given time. And then I used that calculation, wrote that down each battery, uh, instead of basically running them for you know, about four hours each. So we have here is the 2600s. They came out to be full capacity, and then basically 100 milliamps down each one. So 2500, 2400, 23, 22, 21, 2000, and then basically the crap underneath that. So the next step was to build the actual battery packs. I did this by taking thick wire, twisting it together to create a conductive connection that I could then solder across the terminals of the batteries. Now I chose a layout where the cell would actually be opposite each other. So the positive side would be on one side in a row of four, so four in parallel, and then on the other side it would be flipped over so the negative would be next to the positive so I can easily solder those together and then flip it over and solder them back and forth. Using 208 cells, I created four identical battery packs with a total capacity of about two kilowatt hours. So each battery pack had a battery management controller. And this would make sure that every single battery cell in here would remain safe. So you can see all the different wires there. Each one of those wires actually goes to a cell row in this battery pack and makes sure that that cell row remains within a proper operating voltage. This battery pack is like 10 pounds. It's uh, it's not light, but it's not too heavy, but I can use it as a, as a weight training. I can just like move it around, you know, get some muscles in this project. Since I wanted this battery pack to be protected, since I put all the soldering and con uh, conductive wires on the side, I decided to use Plasti Dip. Plasti Dip is like this rubberized compound that kind of just forms this layer on top of whatever you put it on. Okay, what I did with this was I actually coated the batteries. I actually took a piece of cardboard and just drizzled it on top of uh, the terminals of the battery. And then I uh, sprayed the white version on top uh, with the aerosol. Once they dried, I wrapped them in tape to prevent any dust from getting into them. Now I have four batteries ready to go. So the next step was to test the charger for the batteries. For this, I decided just to use a simple power supply that was about 400 to 500 watts. It would convert 120 volts AC that I get from the camp's generator to a DC about 50 to 55 volts. Then we have the DC lines coming out. 
the back of it actually has a knob that you can turn to precisely adjust how much DC power you want to come out. So usually it can go between 50 to 60 volts and you can fine tune it to make sure you get exactly what uh, the top end of that battery should be. So when it lifts the battery's voltage and capacity, when it hits the, uh, the higher end, like 55 volts, that battery is in full. So here you can see, I actually put switches in to disconnect and connect each battery pack to the main drive system. Now I decided to use breakers. These are DC breakers so that they can actually trip in case there's too much current coming through that battery pack just as a safety mechanism. I thought that this was a great idea at the time. Then I figured out it was actually a horrible idea. What ended up happening was they were way too sensitive and would always trip whenever I kind of floored the car, they would quickly trip and I'd actually have to hold them upward so that they'd stay on enough so that when I got the car up to speed, then I can just kind of let them go. So that's like a tip is never to use DC breakers in a system like this because you can't really control the sensitivity of what they're rated for and how they will actually break at. And you can just use your, your battery management uh, system controller to really handle if there's any more or less current uh, restrictions in your system. So you can see the Android tablet there. That was one of my huge design goals for this R car. And that was that I wanted to have this interface and it would also show like real sensor data from the voltages on the batteries, the capacities, and also have real control. So you can actually use a touch panel, turn on batteries on and off, you can actually turn the charger on and off. And then you can see the temperature readouts from different parts of the, uh, of the R car as well. So, you know, how's the charger temperature, how are the battery temperatures? The tablet UI was actually written in jQuery. I know, cringe, cringe. Uh, so the customized jQuery UI, uh, the kind of like red data off of a simple server, a service that was running on a Raspberry Pi. And the Raspberry Pi would then continuously pull all the sensor data and store in a database. And then their API would just kind of feed it out to the, the front end. And then whenever you tapped on something, then the, um, the server would turn those mechanical relay switches that I had run the car on and off to disconnect and connect things. So the R-Cars frame was made with 8020. You might've guessed it. You should've guessed it. That's what 8020 is right there. This is one inch by one inch 8020. You can see it has the grooves in the side. Pretty lightweight. This is just feels like nothing, almost like a piece of plastic almost, but it's pretty, pretty strong, pretty rigid. It's, you know, I could not break this with my hand right now. And this is what the R-Cars frame was built in. With the reason for using 8020, if you make something lighter, you can propel it using less battery power. So there's the efficiency of using uh, aluminum. And the other big thing is aluminum is a lot easier to cut than actual steel. So I used a hacksaw to cut all of the aluminum. That ended up not being the best idea either. Uh, hacksaw is really rough and it's, it's labor intensive and I ended up actually cutting my thumb pretty badly. I actually still have the scar from it. I went about, I would say, a quarter way into my thumb with the saw blade. I did get pictures, but I'm not gonna show them to you. That took about a week or two to heal, so that was a whole bunch of downtime. Luckily, I didn't do any damage really to my, my finger that wasn't permanent, but it just goes to show you like another life lesson of making sure you're using the right tools for the job. So in the future, Arcar, you'll see I'm using a bandsaw, and then that was a much better approach. This is the build so far. Just positioning where about the uh, wheels are gonna go uh, in relation to the inside of the frame. Uh, the idea with this one is basically, instead of doing the wheels on the outside, which you commonly see in like a go-kart, uh, we're putting the wheels on the inside so that we can build the saucer section of the, uh, the Starship easily on the outside without having any, uh, you know, wheel wells or any kind of problems with that. Within just a few weeks, the frames were able to come together. Lower supports were added to hold the saucer at the very bottom of the car. They're built to be removable so we can easily transport the vehicle. With just three months left till Burning Man, things started to get down to the wire. So many memories. So this is one of the only pieces left over from the original R car. Most of the actual pieces were, were reused in the, in the new R car that you'll see. But this is one of the original uh, pieces that is kind of just floating around here. That comes to steering. Steering. There was a lot of work done to connect different pieces together, like the steering wheel, like an adapter plate that went down to uh, one of these shaft collars, then went down to like a steering column, which was basically just like a rod that went down to these go-kart spindles and, and this kind of like internally made turning steering system, the bunch of uh, gear drive that made it possible. So that was actually one of the big challenges was bringing the weight distribution from just this box down into those tires through the inside base steering mechanism. The frame had to go into the middle of the car and then come out where the two wheels would be turning. And since the wheels are turning inside of the, the platform box, there really isn't a lot of space for you know support beams. So everything has to be in the very center and then going into that axle and, and holding it. So that was very challenging to get that to be, even just for four people, you know, four people is, could be 600 pounds. That's still kind of a lot for these like little go-kart parts in this design. 
I've actually doubled up the uh, bar here and then the bar here for uh, extra support because uh, right now the body comes down here in the frame and actually comes down, uh, the weight actually comes down when you're sitting on it in the frame and then goes through this member here and then disperses up the back and up the front to the tire assembly, which goes here. My garage has so many leftover projects that parts of projects, projects that I didn't finish. Does everybody's garage have these kinds of things? Like every time I come in here and I like look at things, I'm like, I can build something else with that or I remember the memories from that. We first tested the motor with some battery packs. Then we mounted it to the actual frame of the vehicle and then that's where the fun began. Oh. So you may have actually used a jumper cable before and that's the same principle that's going on here is that jumper cable when you connect it to a battery terminal will have some sparks there and whenever you're kind of working with a system like this it's actually always a good idea to use a physical switch so that it's contained uh, and there's no spark because sparks can melt in and, and weld things together and cause damage. We quickly realized that this motor had way too much RPM and low torque and needed to be geared down and also supported into the frame. That's what we did right here. Even with this crazy gear down, the RPM was way too high. I was worried this motor was actually going to break. So I decided to replace it with a heavier duty motor. This is the golden motor, it's about 10 horsepower and 3 kilowatt. After being installed with a reasonable amount of gear down, it ended up providing us with a reasonable amount of torque. This is actually one of the original saucer panels for the art car, the actual light panels. It's very eco-friendly and cheap to, to build. This is really just the plastic, uh, corrugated plastic with drill holes and uh, zip tied LED strips that were then at the bottom of the art car like this. And then the diffused plastic panels would be on top to create that, uh, create that look. So when working with LED lights and pixels, it can be very blinding to look directly at a pixel. So it's important to find some sort of material that you can use as a diffuser to disperse that light around it. What we ended up using was just simple polycarbonate plastic. So that's clear plastic uh, polycarbonate. With some spray frost type aerosol that I was able to find at Home Depot. Then we sprayed it on top of the polycarbonate panels to create the diffusion. It was a pretty simple solution and I really liked how the nacelles would light up. So to get the car to Burning Man, we rented this van, uh, which is a, not that expensive option of a vehicle that had a certain volume of space inside of it that the, the little art car could fit into. So part of the design and requirements for the art car was to actually be able to have the, the sides break down enough with the panels to break down off so that it can be put into this type of van to transport to, to Burning Man. So with any project like this where you have to actually transport something to, to the site, uh, it's important to figure out kind of like how you're going to get it there because the cost of, of transporting something is, is usually pretty high, especially if you have to kind of keep that transport vehicle for, for several weeks while you're at an event and then bring it back. Or if there's like many, many miles. So Burning Man for us from Los Angeles, it's about 600 miles to Reno. And then as well as Burning Man event is about a week. So that rental of that vehicle, that, that uh, flat, flat platform of transportation is, is quite expensive. So we ended up just using a rental van and designed the small art cart to kind of break down and fit inside the back of that van. And then everything else for the camping, so the, the tent and the sleeping bags, and everything else would fit in the back of the, the van as well. So we could dual purpose that. Enter guy, made it to Burning Man 2015. Here's a line of the art cars around us. Pretty crazy, it's a huge circle of people in art cars. Tens of thousands of people. Looking back at this project, I really have to say thank you to Matthew and John who are fundamental in making sure it got done on time. Thank you guys. The air car performed pretty well for its first year, only breaking down a couple times with some minor issues. It's always inspiring to me to see what other people are creating for their art cars and art projects at Burning Man. Every year there's something new and unique. If you haven't been to Burning Man yet, I definitely recommend going. With the success of the Enterguys art car prototype, we learned the whole process from designing, building, getting approved, transporting to Burning Man, having a car around Burning Man, um, having guests on it, 
giving those people rides. So in 2016, I decided to decommission the original R car and to reharvest all those parts to make the bigger and grander enter guys that you see today. And that's what this whole series is basically about, is the building of this big, big R car. It's next to me, but you can't see yet. And that's what the uh, the next few episodes will, will follow the construction and design and, and challenges of this real life-size R car. It was made from the bones of the original uh, R car in today's episode. So you might ask, what is actually left from the original Burning Man R-Car? There's a few pieces here and there. I still have the original nacelles. But what I found after taking the whole thing apart was several, several pounds of Burning Man sand was stuck inside of it. So here's my bucket of original Playa sand. Uh, it's kind of like this fine flour powder that kind of gets stuck in your hands uh, and it stays in the air. Uh, so this is, this is what I have left. Uh, dust, dust. On the next episode, we get started on the much larger Enterguys 2017 R-Car, from the design to acquisition of real car parts. Don't forget to like and subscribe!